Come here, Mike. When you hear Mike play, when you hear this brother on the saxophone, you hear a distinct voice, a unique voice. I call it the triple threat. So that's the section. He has the good time band, and then he features with artists, and then he records his own thing. He does all that. To say his name, and it carries credibility in the industry at the highest level among featured artists and their supportive cast. Jill Scott, Patti LaBelle, Jasmine Sullivan, New Edition, Mary J. Blige, this man is everywhere with everybody. Once you get on the stage with Mike, you don't want to get off the stage with Mike. I'm Dr. Tyron Cooper, the director of the Archives of African American Music and Culture here at Indiana University. And I am excited today. I got my longtime brother here, longtime friend, Mr. Michael Burton. What's up, brother? Man. Yeah, let me just say thank you, brother, for, for uh, having me. My years at IU were some of the best times of my life, man. And uh, just thank you. I want to just, you know, kind of reminisce a little bit before we really get into, you know, kind of what you're doing currently. Okay, so the, the space that I'm sitting in right now is mm -hmm. the Grand Hall of the Neil Marshall Black Culture Center. You said something that was really interesting about the idea of, you know, kind of uh, acknowledging and engaging a diverse setting, uh, being inclusive in a sense. Right. While it's grounded in this framework of blackness, Man, this was a really multicultural experience that we had right here in this room. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, you know, uh, the, the, the School of Music was amazing, you know, very, uh, very hard at times, you know, um, just trying, trying to get through it, you know, even uh, in undergrad and also stayed for grad school, too. But the African American Arts Institute and the Black Culture Center, I mean, I think definitely without those two institutions, I probably would not have made it through college just to give me a sense of home. It just really gave me an identity. I think I really would have been lost, lost in the sauce, lost in the shuffle if those places were not there. Everybody in the house, give it up for 2002 IU Soul Review. We started out as students together because I did. And then I, came, I left, graduated in 98, came back yep. in 99 and became the director of the IU Soul Review. The Soul Review was always a great ensemble, but when you came back, brother, you took it to a whole nother level, man. One of three ensembles housed in the African American Arts Institute, the Soul Review performs black popular music from blues to hip hop. These ensembles are courses within the Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies. I would say from 99 till I got my master's in 02, man, like that's been the, the foundation for what I've been doing since I left school. You know, yeah, I got two jazz degrees, but most of my work is in R&B, pop, soul, gospel music. That's, that's my bread and butter right now, man. Mike was already always ready to step out, like to do his, his, his improvisational moment. Mike, you in the groove, you in the moment. It's a Mike. And he stepped to the mic and he just be ready. Me and Mike are also feeling the entire band back here. They understand how to support him. So by the time he builds that solo to the climax, it's almost as if the band grows three feet taller. The crowd, uh, they're off their seat and they're right here. They're responding and they're contributing to the performance via their responses. Yeah, you gotta play, play that thing. They're singing along, they're clapping along, they're stomping their feet. This is all, everybody's engaged now. This is an organic moment where everybody contributes to the performance. Mike was facilitating that moment. 
So we understand those expectations. Why? Because many of them grew up in the black community that governs those expectations in performance. The soul review, whether you were black, white, I don't care who you were. This is the framework in which we operate in this particular class, in this particular ensemble. This is the performance tradition that we will cater to. All of this is centered in this black performance tradition. That's what Mike was doing when he was a student here. That's what Mike continues to do as a professional musician. When I think about our time here as students, you know, we're both in the right. jazz studies department, under studying right. under, under the great David Baker, Professor David Baker. David Baker yes, sir. I'll never forget him. I, I heard you say on an interview a while ago that you're still working on some of the things that he was teaching us. And I, I'm telling you, I think this is, he had to have known that this was gonna be a life journey for us. Yes, he, and he would say, you know, Take this stuff, but it's like talking. It's like, you know, you, 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 you learn these tools you're here, but then when you get off in the real world, you just can pull from it. Like if I'm talking to you and I'm just carrying a conversation, I have the vocabulary to, to pick words. I don't even know what I'm gonna say next, but it's just coming out of my mouth. You know what I'm saying? And that's how he wanted us to, you know, take his, uh, his teachings and, and, you know, and uh, apply it to our playing, you know? So he was, he, he, he was the greatest, man. We were, were taught that we didn't do anything halfway. And, you know, Mr. Brown would tell us in his marvelous homespun way, he would say, think this way. You might be out talented, but you're never going to be outworked. Uh, you know, I have to come with this one. That group is who? Legacy, yes, man. That's me, you, uh, Dino Sanders, and Lance Tober. This was at Scotty's, man. You remember that? Scotty's Brew House. Yep, they had just opened. Yeah, man. Yep, they just opened. And, and so at that time, we had Bear's Place, which was like, you know, the, the traditional jazz hub in a sense, you know, if you want to call it that. And then we started to make this place a scene. You remember? Yeah, we did. We we are really the ones that made that a, a, a spot. It was once a week. I don't know if it was every Thursday or Tuesday or something, but, but folks were showing up. This was called Scotty's a while ago. It's now Yogi's. This was a jumping spot. Thursday nights at Scotty's was the joint. You would see us from the street and you see all the excitement in Scotty's and it would just drive people to come see our performance. So for us to be doing what we were doing, which was really a, a gumbo, a fusion of jazz, of course, but also our gospel roots and R&B soul, poppy type of stuff, you know, we were really ahead of our time for, for, for back in those days, you know. I just think it was a really fruitful time for all of us. And I think it was, a, it was like really that pivotal moment when we started getting these aha moments. Didn't always necessarily know how to deal with it. Like you said, we were, all, we were real still kids, man. We were just trying to figure out what we were doing, man, you know. We were growing up together here at Indiana University. And so this was really a definitive time for us that, that would really propel us into manhood. So when I think about the times that we were performing together back in the day, it brings back memories of growing up, growing up away from home, but at the same time, carrying that cultural memory of home with us in this Indiana space. I want people to understand that you didn't just arrive here. Right. That your life has been steeped in artistic expression, really from a from a child, you know, right. um, you grew up in in Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi. Yes. Uh, excuse me, brother Frank. Excuse me. Huh? Excuse me, brother Frank. We love gospel music. Yeah, we sure do. Y'all love gospel music. Yeah. Yes, right. Okay. And we love the Mississippi Mass Choir. Yes, All right. right. Yeah. But. We really love gospel rap. Yeah, you sure do. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You really love gospel rap? <laughs> yeah, you know gospel rap like Preachers in the Sky, yeah. Mikey. Yeah. Oh yeah, I know those guys. So what we <laughs> want to know is, how come the Mississippi Mass Choir doesn't rap? Yeah, just why? Why? Believe it or not, this question was asked earlier 
And we, was, we, we weren't ready that time. But we were ready this time. My mom singing with the Mississippi Mass back in the day uh, was a major inf influence on me as a child. I mean, I was probably 10, 11 years old. Back, when she started singing with them, so I was going to the, to the rehearsals, you know, hiding up under the pews and, uh, <laughs> you know, going to the live recordings and even getting to go on the road with them sometimes, you know, just just to be around and, and see and see those guys, David Curry, Jerry Smith. Uh, Frank Williams, late great Frank Williams. See, that's the Mississippi song that we're saying. Just seeing that as a kid and really just, you know, not even knowing how important it was at the time. Probably around 15, 16 years old, man, um, I started to really have those dreams and aspirations, man. Uh, and in high school, uh, that's a mirror high school, and I, I went to the performing arts wing. It's called APAC back in the day. And we had uh, Victor Goins, who's a great saxophonist, clarinetist for Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra. He came to my high school. He was just talking about his career and he, how he travels the world and does this and does that, you know. You know what? what I love about you, man, is you, you don't forget where you are from. Uh, you always, you know, just engage in your community. Uh, I think these two people right here instilled that in you. Can you see that photo? This is Miss, Mrs. Ann and Dr. Otha. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Most definitely, man. Most yeah. definitely, bro. My, my, my father would always tell me, even when I thought I was getting good, I'm 14, 15 years old, playing my little solos at church, playing my little hymns, doing the offering. He'd be like, son, I always stay humble. You know, the same guy that gave it to you, he can take it away. You know, I, I really hold that near and dear to me. After my junior year of high school, my parents and my church, they sent me up to Boston for the summer to Berkeley. And I got up there and I heard these kids from South Africa and Israel, all over Europe and all over the States. And they, when they were blazing, I'm talking about 15, 16, 17 years old. I said, well, man, you know, maybe it's time for me to spread my wings and, and leave home and go out and study somewhere else and just meet some other people. And, you know, but I knew I wanted to go see the world and see other places. This is what? This is hot music, hip hop jazz for your amusement. You can dance and chill, act alive. You can ride a vibe to it. Find yourself, know thyself, grow thyself, but don't lose it. You can kill a hate. Been doing this for a while, man. Uh, most recently, uh, before this whole COVID situation, I was touring with Miss Patti LaBelle. We can't undo this, all I know. Touring with Jill Scott for, for a long time. We work with Tyler Perry for at least a decade, working on all his stage plays and uh, some movies and TV shows. It takes courage to love again when you've been hurt. Uh, Anita Baker, Mary J. Blige, I do quite a bit with uh, Adam Blackstone and Daniel Moore. They are music directors in the industry and do a lot of TV show stuff with them, award shows, BET awards, Soul Train awards. So yeah, man, just trying to stay stay busy. These are Grammy award winning artists, man. You've done so much, it probably all gets a little muddy. You know, it's like you move from one, one hit to the next hit and you got to get that last hit out of your head to, to concentrate on what's to come, right? A lot of cats say you're only, you're only as good as your last gig, man. So you don't have time to, to, to dwell on what you did. You know, you got to prepare for which was coming up. You have been on stage with these folk. What goes through your mind, Mike? Man, it's just, it's all God, man. It's, I, it's just, it's a blessing. Each opportunity, man, I just, I count it all joy, man. And I'm just, you know, grateful, you know, seriously grateful, man. I love that about you, man. And you've always had this heart. The single that you just put out, Let the Church Say. Yes, sir. Did you write that based on what's going on now? When did you write that? You know, just from what's going on with the police brutality, George Floyd. I mean, you can even go back, you know, years. But just the, the climate in America this summer, man. I just wanted to speak to it. You know, you know, you guys might say, you know, a lot of these guys' songs uh, have a lot of political messages, kind of, you know, message music or whatever. But some of my favorite stuff is Donny Hathaway, Stevie Wonder, Aretha Franklin, a lot of people that were speaking to the times that they were living in. And this song in particular speaks to police brutality. I, you know, even with all this going on, I still see the best in people. I see the best in our human nature, you know, so I just hope and pray for us that we get it right. And, uh, you know, and see the greater good in all of us. That's right, Black Lives Matter. Officer, please stop killing us and let the choir say. You know, I really think our art should be used for this as, as opposed to, you know, I mean, it's cool. It's great to have a good time and have fun and be lighthearted. And, but, 
you know, if, if I got a chance to say something, I'm gonna try to say something with some weight to it and make people think about something, you know, and hopefully they'll enjoy the music as well, but they'll get something from it. He's doing that at the highest level in terms of this, the commercialization of music performance, while at the same time maintaining his link to the community. That's very difficult to do. He's, he's been very successful at making that happen. Again, as, I just think that it's his humanity that, that rings loud. Mike really carries himself with a deep sense of gratitude, respect, and love for others. And everybody can gravitate towards that. So I would, I would have my students take away the grit that Mike uh, exemplifies, the sincerity, uh, the courage to step out and try new things to, to broaden oneself. I think there's so many lessons one of my students, or all of my students I would say, could learn uh, from observing Mike's trajectory uh, in the industry. Okay, that was tight. <laughs> that was cool. Let the choir say, let the church say, I don't know. Was that phenomenal? It was phenomenal. <laughs> and it's really cool to see how he's in front of um, a band, leading a band. It's kind of like he, the instrument was a part of him. Even just how he was like holding it to cue, like he would point at people with it. So it's an extension of him and his personality, you can definitely tell. He just is so creative and it's so cool to see what he does. So I follow him on Instagram. And one thing I really like about him is one day I reached out to him for advice and he gave me advice. Like it was nothing, he was he's just like, I'm an old person just like you, I'm here to help you. I'm here to tell you what you can do. But what he does on his Instagram is he'll give you behind the scenes looks of how he records. So I get to see all his layers on when he's recording and how he layers all these sax parts and how he puts different horns with them. And then you get to see the next process where he takes that and then uses it for shows. And then it kind of is like another inspiration of how I said I wanted to do my own thing. It shows that you should use your God-given talents to heal the world, especially with what's going on right now. I think that's what he would want. I'm pretty sure that's what he would want. And in your music, I also hear a faith. It makes me grapple with what's going on in the secular realm on spiritual terms. Mm -hmm. Pray. Yeah. Brother, that's a masterpiece. Everybody just pray for America, Syria, Nigeria, North Korea. Man, you know, I think really the, the greatest gift I've gotten from being, being a musician is just being able to travel the world, meet people from all walks of life, man, from different countries, different faiths, religions sit down and break bread with these people, man, have a drink with these people, whatever, and just see that we all just people, man. Yeah, I think, you, again, you've been, you've been raised to do that, right? Yeah. What does that feel like to be raising girls who are so free in their thinking? Yeah, my oldest, uh, Layla, she's 12, and then Kaden, she's nine. They are uh, loving my life, man. Super talented kids, good kids, smart kids, respectful kids. We are here to, to push them like that. I think if more parents thought like that, the world would be a better place, man. You know, if we raise our kids to to be free thinkers, man, to not judge folks, to think that they can accomplish anything. I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about these folk right here. Yes, yes, my beautiful wife, yes, who I met in the IU Soul Review, hey, amen. Said she had this vision, she saw herself in the chef coat. And I'm like, hey, you know, you could cook, cook like that, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I don't even know where it came from, man. But now, bro, like, she is, she's one of the premier caterers, chefs in, in Metro Atlanta, man. Like, she's done major stuff. Queen Latifah, Gabrielle Union, Tyler Perry Productions, all kind of t TV. It's amazing. So, yeah, she, 
You and Razia talk about the power couple. My daughter called me yesterday and she said, She said, How long will you be away? And I said, I said, This tour lasts 30 days. And she said, She said, Nothing. You make your money on the road, man, but you also are, are, are a family man. You want to hold your family together and, you know, be there for your kids and raise your kids. So just the struggle of trying to figure that out. We have dreams and aspirations of doing these great things and seeing the world and making this music. But you also want to raise good kids and, you know, have a healthy marriage. And I want them to believe that it's all possible. You know what I'm saying? Whatever it is. Mike and Razia maintain that family. This is really unique for Mike, who's this high energy, high, highly active brother in the industry. He's constantly on the go, but at the same time, always present at home. This man is raising his kids. This man is loving his wife. And so to see him give back and like, you know, jamming out with his daughters and giving them lessons and you hear him on their on his recordings. So he's given them that musical legacy, he's given them that cultural legacy, but he's also given them that legacy of love. Thank you guys that today. My family is the best in the world. Amen. Well, Mike is interesting um, because we currently do not have a collection in Mike's name. We don't have a Michael Burton collection yet. Your work is like a whisper to the sun, it's time to rise, rise. To turn around into that moon, that it's time to hide. hide. The majesty of At Triple AMC, we just established the new Mickey Tucker collection, a pianist who supported huge names like Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, Little Anthony and the Imperials, Rasan Roland Kirk and George Benson to name a few. But he also created his own discography as a featured artist. Mike Burton's career currently follows along the lines of Mickey Tucker's. And unboxing Mickey's materials makes me wonder, with Mike currently operating in the digital age, how is he preserving his cultural materials? Are they physical copies of scores like Mickey's or might they be mostly digital files of his musical charts, photos, videos? Instead of physical letters, would he save emails? Dizzy Gillespie and Mickey. I knew this one was gonna be 80s or up. Yo, said, Yo. what's up? <laughs> Recording studio in New York City for The Crawl, uh, yeah. May 1979. The letters, press releases, the kinds of things that can so easily be sent through an email nowadays, which you wouldn't even think to save. I don't think it's inherently less valuable. I just think that a lot of it's going to get lost when we get collections in the future where an artist didn't think to save the emails they were sending back and forth. For, from our perspective, I think it's going to be important for us to educate potential donors about what is what, what they should be saving, because you're right. So it's digital born, you know, but it's still valuable. And also the archives can help bring some significance to the clutter or these items that we're trying to get at, it's important that we make that transition in the digital realm. Uh, what would a collection look like in 20 years? So Mike is the guy that we are um, really kind of tracking, if you would, a featured artist himself, a producer. This is a legacy in the making. This is exciting for me to watch him, to observe uh, all of the moves that he's making for himself, for his family, for his community. Because the messages in his music, the sounds, the grooves in his music, these are global. He is something special and unique in this industry. That's a great legacy. I want to just, just elevate you in our own way. Razia said hello. Put, come here, Razia. You want to come in and just wave at the, at the people? Razia, oh, Lord. <laughs> he said, oh, Lord. <laughs> I love you, girl. I'll never get to talk to you. Thank you for all that you did for both of us. The education girl. is real. All that you did for black music. So I'm thankful. Oh. Thank you so much. Man, we got to keep in touch, man. But real talk, when when all this crazy stuff is done, we're we going to come back up to uh, to Indiana, man, and, and, and bring the girls down to Bloomington, man, so they can see where mom and daddy met and hang out. And, and y'all can give them that full scholarship. Amen. Hey, man. Come on, man. <laughs> Let's do it. 
Mike, now my last question to you is, what would you tell, what would this Mike Burton tell 17, 18 year old Mike Burton? Wow, great question. Uh, I would tell him that it's gonna be all right. You know, don't, don't worry about um, tomorrow. Like just keep doing what you're doing, you know, block out the naysayers, uh, stay positive, man. Ah, you know, don't